My name is Brendan Hassan. So I'm a professor of mathematics at Brown and the director of ISERM. ISERM is the Institute for Computational Experimental Research in Mathematics. We're part of Brown University. Our core funding is from the US National Science Foundation, but we get additional funding from the Simons Foundation, the, the Microsoft and, and individuals and academic sponsors. We're interested in promoting positive feedback between mathematics and computation algorithm and software as an outcome of mathematical research, but also computational experiments as a source of inspiration and a testing ground for mathematical ideas. So Sabetta, well, Elizabeth, I should be more formal in an introduction. Um, Matsumoto is an assistant professor at the School of Physics at Georgia Tech. She has undergraduate and graduate degrees in physics from the University of Pennsylvania and did postdoctoral work at Harvard and Princeton before taking her current position. Her, Research has been recognized in many ways, in particular by a career award from the National Science Foundation. And so this award has the best title I've ever seen in an NSF award, and so I'll have to share it. What a tangled web we weave, topology and mechanics of textiles. I've never had such a catchy title on any of my grants. Um, so, so Matsumoto has been a really wonderful supporter of ISERM. She was a, a leader of our fall 2019 program on illustrating mathematics which brought hundreds of mathematicians and artists to share their insights on the representation of mathematical ideas through physical and, and visual means. We really look back fondly on this program as our last uh, pre-COVID program. And in some sense, it was one of our most dynamic and, and publicly engaged programs ever. We really, really enjoyed having this group at ISERM and we, we had a, a maker's lab and all sorts of cool things happening during that semester. Her specific area was a computational textiles working group and so she led um, activities on hyperbolic quilting, and it was cool to have a hyperbolically curved uh, quilting um, product on site. And she's also written extensively on techniques of non-Euclidean virtual reality using software to visualize non-Euclidean geometry that was in some sense intended never to be connected to the real world. But nowadays we have machines that help us to visualize it. So we're really proud to have her speaking to, to us tonight. She'll speak on Naughty Knits, an evening of math and crafts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brennan. Thanks everyone for being here. It's absolutely a treat to be back at ISERM, even if it's virtually. Um, I guess I, I recognize some of the audience members here as participants and friends from that semester. Um, and I guess, I just wish I could uh, see all of you in person. So let me share screen. Um, and start the talk. So I'm telling you a bit about, I guess a whole bunch of different things, but a lot of the ways in which we can learn from arts and crafts like textiles how do we use those to learn about um, geometry um, and some topology so before I really get started oh I should um, point out that um, everyone should um, feel free to leave questions in the chat um, and I will do my best to answer them uh as fast as i can read them um so i wanted to point out the wonderful people in my group who have taken part in some of the research part that, that i'll be telling you about so uh krishma single is a phd student in my lab and she worked with uh mike dimitriev who is a former postdoc in my lab and so they tried to study the mechanics of knits. Um, Shashank Markande was a former PhD student in my group, uh, and he worked a lot on the knot theory part, portion of, of the knits. And Lewis Campbell uh, was an undergrad. He's now graduated and will be taking a position um, at Cornell in their textiles department. Um, and he was doing a project um, to digital design of seams for clothing. And I'll show you some of the work that, that he's done. So 
in our group, we like to think that knits are a type of coding. So you may have heard um, that the uh, Jacquard loom was the first digital technology. Um, so this is um, a picture of what the, the loom would look like. And it's run by all of these punch cards. And you, anyone who's interested in the history of computation might recognize some of the first um, punch card uh, design computers. Uh, well, they won't have all of these strings, but they will still be run in a very similar way. And so the idea of the Jacquard loom is that when you weave something, you're basically taking threads and you're going to run another thread through them. And you get a choice, um, is it going to go over or under those threads? So what the Jacquard loom does is it gives you the ability to individually address every crossing and say, is it over or is it under? So this is um, a picture of um, a, a modern day textile being made on a Jacquard loom here. This is a portrait of a woman. Um, and so this is, this is what happens in um, weaving, but knitting is a little bit more interesting in some senses. Um, so this is a zoom in of that picture um, from, from the first slide. <laughs> Um, and then this is the pattern that made it. And the pattern, it's called the Dragon of Happiness. And it was designed by a woman called Sharon Winsauer. Um, and every little itty bitty symbol you see here, there's some like equal signs, circles, slashes, triangles, all sorts of things. Each of these encodes a different topological manipulation of your yarn and your needles. Um, and this particular piece um, is really interesting to me and in some senses inspired me to start uh, this particular research area. Um, so when I was making it, I guess I was a grad student and I'd been knitting for forever. Well, not forever, but you know, for I guess a decade or so at that point and was really good at lace. I really liked lace. And so I was like, oh, I've seen everything, you know, and there's nothing, new. you know, how like 20 somethings are. Um, so I was like thinking like that. And then this particular piece um, came up and it showed me a stitch that I'd never seen before. So there are these stitches that are in the, um, I guess, flames coming out of the dragon's head or its horns, I'm not quite sure which that have these sort of equal signs. Um, and that was a stitch that I hadn't seen before. And so that um, started to get me to ask the question, well, what can be knit? I mean, there was some library that I sort of thought was exhaustive and well, I, I guess I was wrong because here's a new stitch. Um, and so one of the things my group was trying to understand is, is what can you knit? Um, so let me zoom in a little bit at exactly what's going on here. So here I have two needles. I've got a needle in my left hand and a needle in my right hand. Um, and you can imagine that um, this piece of yarn is sort of infinitely long and I've just grabbed some point in the middle of it. And I've got a bunch of loops on my left needle and a bunch of loops on my right needle and then this is going to be the, what's called the working yarn, the yarn that I'm going to use to make the next stitch. So to make a stitch, I take my right needle and I put it into the first loop on my left needle. And then I wrap the working yarn around it and pull the loop through the loop on my left needle and then slide it over to the right needle. And so this is the process of making knits. It's just pulling loops through loops. And if I were to sort of zoom in on it, this is what it would look like if I just looked at a single stitch. So I had a loop here and then I sort of pull a loop through. 
Um, and this is this is kind of a funny picture. This is a picture that looks like I'm playing a game of of asteroids. So when I go off the top of the screen here, I appear in the bottom of my image here, and the same with the left and the right. And if I were to tile this out, this is sort of what the fabric might look like. Um, and I have some of that fabric here. This particular fabric to a hand knitter, I guess we would call it stockinette stitch. It's just made of all knits. Um, and if I were to turn it over, this would be called reverse stockinette stitch. So to the back side of stockinette stitch. And when I showed you the knit side, I was making these loops by pulling a loop from the back of the fabric through to the front. And so if I turn it over like this, I'm making loops by taking a loop from the front of the fabric and pulling it through to the back. And so we call those purl stitches. And it turns out that if you combine these knits and purls in different ways, these are all just repeated patterns, you get all sorts of different types of elastic properties. The first one here, it's called garter stitch. It's alternating uh, rows of knits and purls. Uh, and so this is, um, this is much stretchier than the initial fabric, the stockinette stitch. And in fact, it's very stretchy um, in this vertical direction. And it's a little bit less stretchy in the horizontal direction. If I were to take um, alternating columns instead of alternating rows, I end up with this fabric. This fabric is called ribbing um, and it's really, really stretchy. It's like an order of magnitude stretchier than the stockinette stitch in the horizontal direction. And they're approximately as stretchy as one another in the vertical direction. So you can see that this is nowhere near as stretchy as the garter stitch. And then here's another sample. This is called seed stitch. So this is a checkerboard pattern of knits and purls. Um, and it's, uh, again, very stretchy in this direction. And it's about as stretchy as garter in this direction, and maybe just a smidge less stretchy in this direction. So it's pretty stretchy, but not quite as stretchy. So my uh, student, Krishma Single, and former postdoc, Mike Dimitriev, were studying what it is about um, the geometry of these stitches or, or the topology of the knots that are made from them um, as like, what is it about that that makes these different textiles have such different mechanical properties? Like, it seems like they should be the same. I'm just pulling loops through loops, but they behave really differently. Can I ask a question? So yes, just please. the seed stitch and looking at the design, mm -hmm. is it symmetrical under rotations by 90 degrees or? Uh, I so mean, it... Knits themselves aren't symmetrical under rotations. They have a, they have a, a direction to them. So if you kind of look at the crossings, if it, I oh, were I'm to sorry. look at this, I have like one sort of crossing horizontally and two vertically. So if I were to rotate it, I'd have two horizontally and one vertically. So it's already kind of broken rotational symmetry that way. I understand. All right. Thank you. Yeah. The, the K and P design is symmetric, but not the, 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 the fabric itself. All exactly. right. Exactly. Thanks. Are yeah, and everyone, feel free to jump in with any questions you have. Are there, and if there are other questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat, and and I will I will ask ask the speaker. Um, so we you know we'd love to hear questions and comments. So thanks. And I will be asking you some questions and comments later. So stay close to your keyboards. Um, so I said knots. So what do I mean by knots? Um, before I get there, I have to tell you something about symmetry. So as Brendan pointed out, there were some symmetries to the pattern and then some symmetries to the uh, object itself, the, the knit stitch 
that weren't quite the same. So the pattern had this rotational symmetry, but the knit stitch itself doesn't. So the definition of symmetries is a symmetry is a transformation or like a motion of the object that leaves it looking the same. So imagine I were to pick this tablecloth up and rotate it by, I think there are 12 of these. So I rotate it by one twelfth and I end up with a tablecloth that looks identical to this. So that's a symmetry. So I'm gonna show you some different flags. Um, so what symmetries, what symmetries do you see here? Please feel free to type stuff into chat. I think I can see all of your chats. And if not, Brendan, please uh, jump in with what their answers are. So I guess these are some sort of no <laughs> uh, claim to from answering. <laughs> um, uh, okay, fantastic. Uh, Louise says um, mirrors and rotations. Okay, someone says Tennessee doesn't have any. Some says Tennessee, Switzerland. Vietnam, um, there's a rotation by 180 degrees for Georgia. Is there a symmetry that you see that all of these share? So all of these are symmetric in some, some ways, um, but is there any, uh, Stephanie says flipping to the other side. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say yes um, in uh, a slightly qualified way. Um, and Susan says it depends on if you care about the flag rectangle and I don't care about the flag rectangle. So um, I'm just, I'm gonna ignore the fact that these are in a rectangle and just let the pattern continue on forever. Um, someone retra retracts their claim about Tennessee. Excellent, that's great. So, um, and Susan says, I agree, they all have reflections. Um, and someone says, all the red parts have symmetry. Absolutely, all the red parts do have symmetry. Um, so, so yeah, all of these have, have reflection symmetry. So they're all mirror symmetric and they have different numbers of mirrors needed to uh, make their, their symmetry. So. Um, so Albania has one mirror, uh, Georgia has two mirrors, Tennessee has three, Switzerland has four, Vietnam has five. Uh, I'm sure something has six. I don't think anything has seven and Macedonia has eight mirrors. And the great thing about these types of symmetries is that you don't actually need the whole design in order to get all of the information about your piece. So each of these is, each of these dark colored sections is all the information you need to know to recreate the entirety of the object, minus the borders. Um, what about, what about these? So here I'm gonna ignore, I'm gonna ignore colors and ignore the stripes, the, the sort of cuts in the stripes on South Korea. What types of symmetries are common to all of these flags? They're also the United Kingdom's a little, a little iffy. Rotations, rotational symmetry. Excellent, so these all have rotational symmetry. So if I were to, again, look at each of these, um, ignoring their colors, I have 180 degree rotational symmetry about the center for both South Korea and Maryland. Um, the Isle of Man um, is one of the, one of just the coolest flags, um, I think. It has 120 degree rotational symmetry. Um, 
NATO has 90 degree. The UK kind of does. Um, it's a little, it's a little off because the the uh, side in which these are highlighted is a little bit different. Um, and uh, Hong Kong has 70 degree rotational symmetry. So again, we don't need the whole pattern. We just need a small subset of the pattern, again, ignoring colors. And once we know where the symmetry operation acts, um, oh, I guess 72, uh, sorry, I'm not, uh, I got some, uh, I got some uh, uh, arithmetic wrong. Thank you, Louise. Um, so it's 72, 72 I think, um, rotational symmetry. Um, so again, each of these, you don't need to know the entire piece. You just need this small little wedge. And if you know where the symmetry operation acts, you can fill in the rest of the pattern. What about this flag? This is Martinique. What do you think's going on here? I mean, just a shout out, I have to say, this is pretty awesome that you've got um, but like these dynamic snakes on your flag. That's probably one of the coolest flag motifs I've seen. Um, I don't know. What do you all think? Okay, translational, yes. So there's a translational symmetry here. So I don't have mirror symmetries because all of the snakes have their tongues sticking out in the same direction. Same thing is true for rotational, then I'd have a, a tongue sticking out here and then here, here, here. And that's not what we see. So these are translational symmetries. Um, and that's what we see um, in our knits too. But here I wanna show you how you can take that small unit cell, the, the single motif, a single, um, I guess that was a snake, but here's a lion motif, and turn that into your full pattern. So this is a video from the software Attractor. Um, it, is, it is spelled this way. It's um, uh, Portuguese, I believe. So what you're gonna see is we've cut out the, um, the motif, and now we're rolling it up. So I rolled the top and bottom together and then the left and the right together. And now basically the whole thing you do, you just unroll this squiggly tube around this lithorus. And this is going to print out the entire pattern you have. All of two-dimensional space will be covered by this pattern. Um, so that's what we see in this knit. So here we do see that there are these translational symmetries. So I only need to know the information inside this dashed line or this dashed line in order to repeat the entirety of my knit. And so here's how it, it works. So here's the, the 2D drawing of it. And I'm going to glue the left and the right together. And I'm going to glue the top and the bottom together. And I'll do that with this movie. So first, I'm going to take the top and the bottom. I'm going to wrap them around behind the object. And then I'm going to take the left and the right. And I'm going to wrap them around behind the object, behind the knot. And so this is the structure I get. Um, and this is a little bit more complicated than, than what we saw before with the lion. Um, and that's because we need a little bit of thickness to say that one piece of yarn is passing over or under another piece of yarn. So instead of this being on the surface of a torus, this is inside the glaze on the surface of a donut. So the glaze has just a little bit of thickness and that's where my knit, my knit stitches live. And so my student, uh, Shashank, was playing around with these different depictions of, 
of um, knits and he had noticed that um, every knit he had, there are these huge libraries of knitted stitches um, and stitch patterns and things like that. And he had noticed that everyone he tried when he tied up a knot that way had this property that it is called ribbon. So ribbon is a property where you take your knot and you kind of imagine like dipping it in a soap film or something so that there's a disc that goes across the entirety of the knot where the knot is the boundary of it. And then there is um, only one kind of interaction you can get between the discs. So I, there's a place where the disc passes completely through another portion of the disc. Um, so you see one of those singularities here and one down here. And what it forbids you from doing is having these sort of X-shaped singularities. So that, that's what you're not allowed to have. And so he noticed that all of the um, knits that he'd seen are what's called ribbon. Um, and so he made a conjecture that all knitable stitches must be ribbon knots. Um, and that is it's in fact true. Um, but he had seen, he had, he was sort of thinking about it and is like, well, this is something that's ribbon, but is this a counter example to everything that is ribbon being knitable? Um, so he looked at this and it turns out, and he didn't think it was necessarily knittable. And was like, okay, I, th I think I can do it. It's going to be pretty ugly, but I think we can do it. So bring some uh, needles and yarn to the next group meeting and we'll, uh, we'll check it out. And so we did, and this is the stitch that he came up with. He calls it the cow hitch stitch because it reminds him of the cow hitch knot. And so there's six of them here. So they're the ones that have each of these little dollops on them. And so just by using math, he was able to come up with a new stitch that no one had ever tried. And this is doubly incredible because up until his second year of grad school, he had no idea that he was going to be working with knits. He had never knit before. He had never picked up needles and yarn. And this is maybe a year later, he had come up with a new stitch. Just how incredible is that? And this is amazing. Um, and it's all because of math. Um, so what other symmetries can we get out of knits? So this is a type of knitting that um, Susan, who's in the audience, is uh, very, very familiar with. Um, this is called double knitting. Um, so you have two colors at the same time. And when you knit one color on one side, you're knitting the opposite color on the opposite side. So you can basically make these patterns where um, if I were to flip this over, it looks like this. And uh, we had a friend, Fabian Serrier, who was running a company called Knit Yak at the time. And she was making all of these generative art scarves. And um, we were, I guess, bought into her Kickstarter. And one day someone was asking on Twitter, well, what happens if you put them on a Mobius strip? And well, that just got us all started. So we decided to, to think about this. Um, and so the patterns she makes are using what's called cellular automata. So if you imagine taking a pattern of um, instead of binary uh, colors, so blacks and whites, um, you can have any three on top. So here I've got white, black, black. So I can look over here in my chart and I say, here's what, uh, oh, that's, uh, where are we? Uh, oh, white, black, black. So that's gonna give us a color underneath. So it's, this is the correct rule. So this one tells us white. So there's a white dot here. And then black, black, white gives us another one. So this is black, black, white. And here's 
the white dot. So that's the white dot here. Um, so basically it's a set of rules. You read three across and then the next three and then the next three, and that tells you what to fill in underneath. And so uh, we wrote some code to see what, um, what patterns, what rules, there's many, many rules, um, what rules would give us uh, scarves that had this Mobius symmetry pattern. Um, so we wanna make sure that when we, our starting row is gonna be the same as the opposite side of the fabric. So that's sort of the rule um, of, of um, uh, double knitting is that, you know, turning it over gives you the inverse of it. So we wanted to make sure that that, that went through. So we wrote code and we found these, these are two different rules. Um, and these give us two different scarves. So this is sort of following around, I guess, one side of the Mobius strip and it's gonna come back around the other side. So this is what the pattern looks like across the entire scarf. Um, and then it repeats because now it's on the opposite side. So the opposite side has to, because it's got a twist, has to come back with the same original pattern. So there's other kinds of symmetries that we didn't talk about. So here's a couple of different types of symmetries. These are the same ones we saw in the flag. So this is reflection. So we can, again, look at the minimal, um, a sort of fundamental domain, this minimal set that's needed to recreate the entire pattern as long as we have the rule about the mirrors. So mirrors are basically just unrolling, like flipping this guy back and forth. And you can, again, tile out the entirety of the 2D plane with this. And again, this is all animations made by um, the attractor software. Um, and here's another one. These are rotations. Um, so there's a place here I have a... Uh, six-fold rotational symmetry. I have 120 degree rotational symmetry here, and I have, um, oh, sorry, 180 degree rotational symmetry here and 120 degree rotational symmetry here. And so mm -hmm. I can create a pattern just by looking at these guys. So those are the centers of symmetry at the corners of this. We're gonna fold it up again, but now we're gonna create an empanada because the left and the right side aren't quite the same. Now you're gonna, or a samosa, now you're gonna roll this empanada or samosa out and it's gonna alternate printing front side, back side, front side, back side. And as it unrolls, it's going to completely cover the plane and you end up with this pattern. So let's look at this dress. Um, this dress looks like it should have all of the symmetries we want. It looks like it should be fine. Like you zoom in here, this is, this is fine. I guess we see places, there's some mirror symmetries here, mirror symmetries here, and there's a rotational symmetry here. You know, this looks good. But what's going on here? There's still one mirror symmetry here. But if I take a mirror out here, it's not gonna be quite right. So what's going on? So what's going on is curvature. So we're gonna start thinking now about how these symmetries that we've been talking about can relate to curvature. So everything I showed you before was in the plane, but now we're gonna ask what happens when they're on different shapes. So imagine you wanted to sew a shirt. This is a dress shirt, um, a fancy dress shirt. It's not gonna really look like a t-shirt where you sort of cut out two identical parts and sew them together. It's a lot more complicated than this. So this is a pattern for making um, a dress shirt. So one thing you'll notice is that there's almost no straight lines here. There's a couple of places that are that this is 
fold. That's a straight line. That, that kind of makes sense. But, and maybe the, the waist of the shirt is a straight line, but pretty much everything else is curved in some way. And all of those curves are designed to make the shirt fit the human body. Since human bodies, as skinny as you might be, you're still not flat. You still do have some curvature to you. And so we're going to kind of dissect this and see what's going on. So there's sort of two basic things that are going on. These aren't going to be curved scenes just yet, but this is sort of what's going on to start with. So the first thing you might have is called a dart. So that's something that is sort of at the, the bust places that you want to have this sort of conical shape to it. Um, so what you do is you fold your piece of fabric in half and then you sew a diagonal line. Um, and then when you turn it inside out, that diagonal line forms a cone. Um, here is another thing you can have. This is called a godet. Um, this is something you see in um, a lot of sort of tulip skirts and things like that, mermaid skirts. Um, so what you do is you take a wedge of fabric and you put it into an existing seam. And so that basically is adding more area in. So a dart, you can imagine removing the whole bit that's not in the wedge. And here you've sort of taken that and you've added it back to your fabric. And so I'm going to do that again, but here's some um, uh, very symmetric fabric to show you what's going on. So here I've cut out one sixth of my fabric. So now there's, um, here's 300 degrees left over and I'm going to make a cone now. So here, instead of um, 360 degrees about this point, there's only 300 degrees. And instead of a hexagon, now I've got a perfect pentagon. Um, so I've removed this area and turned this into a cone. Away from this point, it looks fine. This looks like it has six-fold symmetry in these sort of local areas. But at some point, that's going to, to, to get disruptive. And that, those points are the points that have curvature to them. So now imagine I took this wedge I cut out and I want to insert it into a new piece of fabric here. So what I'm going to do is do this. And so now I have, instead of 360 degrees about here, I have um, 720 degrees um, about this point. And instead of having a hexagon, now I have a heptagon. And that, so this object now sort of has sevenfold symmetry. And again, it can't lie flat in the plane. And this time, instead of forming a cone, it's all roughly. So I've got too much area to fit it inside the plane. This is uh, the bodice of a dress that was made by uh, friends of mine. So Andrea Shuey is a costume designer and Robin Selinger is a physics professor. And so they decided they wanted to make um, Oh, I said 720. Yes, I mean 420. Thanks, Susan. <laughs> um, uh, so they wanted to make a dress using regular pentagons, hexagons, and heptagons to give it curvature. Um, so you can see that the pentagons are used at the bust. So these are places where you'd want sort of conical symmetry. And the um, heptagons, the, the sevenfold symmetry, are going to be used around the waist, so places where you have this sort of saddle-like structure. So it's going to curve out here, but curve in along here. Um, so this is, um, this is, again, now what you might do um, if you wanted to have curved seams. Uh, so this is joint work with Lewis Campbell, who's um, an undergrad in my lab, and Kelly Depp. Delp, the Kelly Delp, who's in math at Cornell. So imagine you wanted to make a scarf and you started out with these puzzle pieces. Um, all you need to do is sort of cut out some number of these pieces and just sew them laterally together. But now imagine if I sort of zoom in on this, 
um, really, really small, I have these angles to them. So I've got alpha on one side and beta on the other side. Now I can imagine sort of changing these. So here I've made beta a little bit bigger than it was before. So this here, I basically added in this tiny, tiny wedge of area right here. And then I sew it back together. So it's going to give me a little bit of negative curvature. But instead of having negative curvature just at every point, I want to distribute it smoothly along the entire surface. So here's bending it um, by 60 degrees and by minus 60 degrees. So I'm, I'm still adding this area. It's just which direction is my curve going to shift? And here's a little animation that shows you how this might happen. So this is, this is, these are the, the new curves right here. Um, and so now these curves, if I sew this curve over here to this curve over here, now I've got this angle, this extra 60 degrees smoothly distributed throughout it. And this is one of the two um, pieces that we ended up making. So this is the plus 60 on this side and the minus 60 on this side. There's another one where we take the same curves but have them rotated with respect to each other. So what Lewis did was he made these and then joined them together using zigzag stitches to kind of make a smooth seam without sort of um, the bunching that you'd normally get um, by making sort of normal pressed seams. Um, and so this is a scarf from one of his patterns. This is the symmetric pattern. Uh, so this has a really even sort of um, uh, curvature, this sort of negative curvature everywhere. It looks like a saddle. Um, and then here's one where it's the same, uh, it's the same pattern shapes, but now they're sort of rotated. And so this looks like it fits the, um, the shoulders really well because the top part is going to imitate the curvature around the neck. And this bottom part here is gonna imitate the curvature around the shoulders. So you can basically choose how much curvature you want and where the seams sit relative to one another to get garments that fit in different ways. So this is a project that I did while I was at ISERM. Um, so I was interested in um, looking at this triaxial weave, but I wanted to make it into a jacket. Um, so basically it turns out that straight lines on the surface turn into straight lines in the plane by a very specific definition of straight. And that straight is what's called geodesic curvature. Um, it basically is looking at if you've got a curved surface and you take two points on it and you want the shortest path um, in between them, that's what forms a geodesic. And so any curve along those lines has zero geodesic curvature. If it deviates from that, um, it's going to have geodesic curvature. And so the geodesic curvature on, of the curve on my body is the same as the geodesic curvature of these flat strips in the plane. So that's how we created this uh, pattern. And here's it being assembled in uh, the main lecture hall. Um, for those of you who have been to ISRM, if not, it's gorgeous. You should go um, preferably to one of these uh, public lectures when they're live again. You'll get to see this gorgeous room and the whole view of um, downtown Providence. Um, and then here's me wearing it. And you can see how well it fits, even though it looks like all the lines are straight. Um, so I guess the last thing, um, what do you all think uh, these two things have in common? So this is a fancy like couture wedding gown and human intestines. Ruffles. Anyone else? Or are we gonna all stick with, with ruffles as an audience? Folding, negative curvature, villi. Oh, interesting answers. Very interesting answers. Um, 
lots of length and little volume. Yes. Yeah. These are fantastic. Yeah. This is, this is, these are fantastic answers. Um, so the answer I had written was negative curvature, but all of these are correct. Um, although I'm going to say Villa is a little bit different and ask me again in the question and answer session about that. I won't quite have a chance to get there here. Um, so, so I said negative curvature, but, but the, the ruffles fitting, um, you know, having a large surface area and a small volume, the folds, all of this is, is correct. Um, so the other thing about this that's really cool is it's the same mechanism, the same physical mechanism that causes both of these things to have their geometry. So in the dress, what happens is you have, um, some, some boning or something that's stiff and some tool. So tool is the, the mesh stuff, it's quite stretchy. So what you do is you take the tool and you stretch it out as far as hard as you can, and then you sew the um, boning onto it. So that's what's happening here. So what the pink wants to have a short area and the blue wants to have a long, uh, a long perimeter. And when you relax it, they can't both do this. So they compromise. So the large, uh, the large perimeter ruffles, and the short area sort of tries to contract as much as it can. Um, and this type of oops. oops. Okay. Um, so what's happening in the human intestines? is um, is similar. So when we're all embryos, one of the, the first things that happens is um, you undergo what's called gastrulation. Um, so after you kind of get some polarization, so there's like a head side and a tail side, you go through gastrulation. And this is when you go from being a ball of cells to being a donut of cells. You end up making a hole. And this is something that all vertebrates go through. Um, and that is going to eventually form your digestive system. So this is called the, the gut tube. Um, and parallel to that in vertebrates, you form something called the, uh, the neural tube. So that's going to become your spinal cord. And there's a membrane that connects these two called the mesentery. And um, what happens is um, your gut tube grows faster than the mesentery does. Um, and that causes exactly the same uh, effect that the tool and the boning had. So the mesentery is like the tool and the uh, gut tube is like the boning. So what happens is it grows really fast, but it can't quite uh, grow straight to accommodate the mesentery. So it ends up ruffling. And that's why if a doctor were to go in and do an operation on me or you or anyone else, they look basically the same. It doesn't look like someone just took some rope and just shoved it into our guts. It's all um, this geometric process. Uh, does the, me the membrane disappear in adults? I, I saw that there's one question um, above that, but I'm gonna get to you a little bit later, but does the membrane disappear in adults? Um, no, it doesn't. There actually is um, a membrane. Um, it, it is where a lot of the um, blood supply to your small intestine runs through that. Um, so that is still there. In fact, it's just not something that gets in the way of anything. It's just, um, it sort of holds everything together a little bit. Um, let's see. So uh, let's see, I was going to say one more thing about negative curvature, and then I will take some questions. I will remind me to answer uh, the Ville question and Stephanie's question about DNA. Um, so the negative curvature is something you do see in animals and plants. So this is uh, this is a nudibranch, a, a sea slug that's swimming. It has negative curvature, and it's using... Um, these uh, ruffles along its mantle as a way to sort of propel itself forward. It's 
sort of sending waves along there. Um, plants uh, like this curly kale or um, the uh, the uh, coral you see here use negative curvature sort of as a way of increasing their surface area, which increases the amount of nutrients they can get. Um, and the calla lily, I don't know why it does this. Uh, it's uh, beautiful. I imagine maybe it co-evolved with some insects, which is often why flowers have their shapes, but I, I honestly don't know. That's just speculation. Um, so the last thing I'm going to say about the hyperbolic is about the hyperbolic plane. So I showed you all of these things with negative curvature, but the hyperbolic plane is what happens if you take this negative curvature and you sort of extend it everywhere in the plane. And this is um, an image by M.C. Escher, uh, and it was informed by um, the work of Donald Coxeter. And so what you see is um, there's I guess in the center, three angel, uh, three demons interlocking with three angels. Um, and so it's sort of playing with the, this negative space. When you, if you go out here and you look at their toes, now there's again, three angels and three demons. Um, and this pattern sort of repeats all the way around. Um, and if you look at their wingtips here, you see here's four, angels interlocking with four demons. So if you imagine you can trace a circle out where all of their wingtips meet, and you can do that for every set of these. And I'm going to do that here going out like this. And you can do this for all of these forever. But what I want you to imagine is now that these circles, they're not really getting smaller towards the boundary, but they're actually all the same size. So you're going to kind of inflate them and it's going to get ruffles on ruffles on ruffles on ruffles. Um, but we can look a little bit at the, the sort of combinatoric structure of them too. Um, so when I take away the actual image, you have these sort of hexagonal type structures and they meet together in groups of four. Um, so this is something you can imagine taking hexagons, so like this, and um, putting four hexagons around every vertex. So we know that three hexagons around every vertex makes um, uh, a honeycomb tiling. But here, if you put four around them, there's an extra hexagon um, at every point, And that's going to approximate what's called the hyperbolic plane. And um, here's a pattern. Here's a QR code that links to um, a pattern for it. I made this as what we did in our um, quilting with uh, a hyperbolic quilting uh, demo at ISERM. Um, and I guess here's the knitted QR code that unfortunately doesn't scan, but I thought it was kind of anyway. Um, and here's ways of finding me. Um, and thank you so much for your attention and happy to take questions you have. Those starting with the questions I, I didn't have time to talk about um, during, uh, during the actual talk. So I have the burden of being the only one that can clap. So I will do, thank you, thank you very much. So that's the sad thing about the webinar is it, uh, it's the sound of one person clapping. So there's been a lot of comments and, and maybe we can start with the, the, the two questions from Marish on villi and on knitting patterns for the hyperbolic plane. Yeah, so villi is a really interesting question. And so that's another one of these things that um, is based on the sort of elastic mismatch. So the one I showed you, um, they're, they're sort of parallel to one another. I have one material here that's stiff and one material here that's soft. What happens with, with villi is they are glued like this. So I have one material that's stiff here, and then I have a material that's soft that um, I guess you sort of stretch it out and then glue the, stiff material onto it. And then as it 
the soft material contracts, the stiff material bunches up and it makes these wrinkle patterns and those are what end up forming villi. Um, and the other question, I saw it was about DNA, but my control, uh, I guess it ended up being half overlapped by uh, the control buttons on this. Um, could you possibly read it, Brendan? Yes, there was a question. Um, it's interesting that all these things fold, but DNA and other proteins need something to fill the negative space. Okay, so... Yeah, so so I guess that's a really interesting question. So DNA and protein folding, I guess, is oh that's a that's a very interesting question. So there's a couple of different things that go on. So um if you look at all of the DNA in every cell, it's something like two kilometers long. Um and you can imagine a cell is like a microphone big. So you have to get all of this DNA into a small space. Um, and if you actually sort of just crammed it in, um, it there's this sort of like thermal noise. It wants to fluctuate and it wants to be a lot bigger than that space. So there are these complexes. Um, there are... Uh, Histones are the protein and, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the complex they form. Um, it'll come to me in a minute, but basically what happens is that um, you start making supercoiling. So the histones um, wrap, like the DNA sort of wraps around them and they kind of stack together. Um, and then those kind of form these big bundles and then they kind of wrap around each other and that's where supercoiling comes from. Um, and in uh, in your cell, each cell is gonna wanna have different parts of the DNA like accessible. So those are the parts that aren't wrapped up in histones. So if you wanna be able to transcribe a protein then it'll be like loose um, in your genome, um, but the rest of it to keep it out of the way kind of gets wrapped up in these super coils. Um, I guess the protein question is a harder question to answer. Um, so that protein question, like folding proteins is so hard because they exist in, it's this sort of weird in vivo confinement that they fold up in. So if you were to take like the same string of amino acids, you don't always get it to fold up into the same shape unless it's like in body conditions. So it's really like you form these different like subsets of structure. Um, there's like um, alpha helices and these beta sheets are kind of one set of structure and those form pretty regularly, but then how those kind of con like fold up can depend on like is the, um, uh, I think, are they, are they called ribosomes? I'm forgetting the term, but the, the structure that they kind of get assembled, like each protein gets assembled through, gives it certain confinement. Um, and that directs a lot of what the like 3D structure is. Um, so it's really not, it's not a question that you can kind of answer from, from first principles. It's a really like complicated dynamics that goes into that. Let's see. I'm gonna ask a couple more questions. Um, so one is, is there an introduction to knitting theory for abstract mathematicians? And do you also crochet? Um, is there an introduction to knitting theory? Um, I guess, well, we wrote a Bridges paper, uh, Shashank and I did, um, that does kind of introduce it at a, basic scale and we're in the process of writing a like a longer actual paper where we do prove that these are ribbon knots so it sort of talks about what knitting is but that might be still they might assume more knitting knowledge than um than you'd like I mean knitting obviously there's you can learn to knit on the internet but the math part of it why it's interesting um 
Oh gosh, I'm not 100% sure. I don't know, Susan, who's in the audience, if you know anything better, can you throw out some um, some references? You might have, um, you might be able to think on your toes a little better than I can right now. Uh, yes, yeah, Sarah Marie, absolutely. Yes, thank you, Sarah Marie Belcastro. Um, all lowercase. Um, yes, thank you, Susan. Um, she's definitely, um, yeah, I think her site is called Toroidal Snark. Um, she definitely has the, uh, the most comprehensive uh, view of it. And it's, um, it's understandable to mathematicians. I mean, she is a mathematician and she looks at stuff sort of from uh, topological points of view and looks at using math as ways of illustrating topological structures. Thanks, Susan. One last oh, yeah. question. Oh, sorry. Go on. Um, so the new knitting stitch from your student, is it hard to mm -hmm. make? And can you put together a fabric that's exclusively made from that stitch? Oh, that's a really interesting question. It's not easy to make. Um, it's sort of, um, if you are, I get, oh, so Susan asked it. So here you are a knitter. So it basically involves a setup row where you put a whole bunch of, um, I think it's like two yarn overs on either side of the stitch. And then you have to like pull it up and do some kind of nonsense. So it's not easy um it would not make very nice uh fabric if you did it with all the fabric or all of the stitches um it's it it's kind of decorative but it basically has these like long like loops that kind of would get everything caught on them so I don't think it would be really stretchy I think it would be kind of kind of ugly it's cute as a like decorative stitch but I don't think it would work very well as a as a base stitch for everything. Okay, well, thank you very much. It was a fascinating lecture. My nine-year-old is obsessed with knitting and I think this is the first ISERM lecture that he will watch um, when he gets back from his practice. I, 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 talked, I hear from him talking about pearls and knits and I never knew what those things were until this lecture. So thank you very much. Um, we will resume these lectures um, in the in the fall. Uh, Daniela Witten will give a, a lecture on 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 her work uh, sometime this fall. So stay tuned. Um, you can find out more about what's happening at ISRM either through our website or through our various social media feeds through Twitter and Facebook and such. So uh, keep connected. And thanks so much, Sabetta, for a really interesting lecture. And I hope to see all of you again soon, maybe even in Providence. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Brennan. Thank you to the audience for, for being here and asking such amazing questions. Um, sorry I couldn't see you in real life, but hopefully I'll be able to see you again soon.